Jeremy Grantham is the co-founder of one of the world's largest investment firms. He says that stocks are 65% overvalued. He goes on to say that most people don't realize what's coming. He compares the current stock market bubble to 1929 and 2000. I will show you charts on this later. Warren Buffett says it this way, get ready to lose half your money. Hence, he has been accumulating cash to the tune of $144 billion, patiently waiting for the collapse. Of course, he has his critics. Some people don't like waiting. If you've been listening to my broadcast, you know that last year I began warning investors to become defensive or at least cautious. On the other hand, traditional financial advisors and the traditional brokerage industry have been more than willing to subject investors' money to incredible stock and bond market risk. They're still in denial about what is occurring. The traditional investing approach, also called the 60-40 portfolio, has fallen significantly. I'm Ben Ripond. Today is May 31, 2022. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I will begin with an interview with Jeremy Grantham. And since I find myself unexpectedly in the third great investment bubble of my career, basically in the US, so I can't avoid it. And this is a wonderful day to be having this discussion. It's not only victory over Hitler and Russia day, but it's also a day where the market is showing signs of breaking down. Through yesterday, it's the worst opening of a year for the S&P since I was one year old in 1939. I am a pre-war baby. And of course, the Nasdaq is down as we speak, 27.5% from its high, and the Russell 2000 about 23, S&P about 15 and a half. So it's getting to be interesting. And as we were saying before, Bitcoin from some point in the last 24 hours is down 10% to uh, 32,000 and change. So that is getting interesting. And ARK, Kathy Wood's wonderful instrument, is back to it where it was in 2018. I'm not kidding you. It is back below this entire event now, which is quite remarkable, down 75% from its peak, as is AMC down 75% from its peak, and the other meme stocks are in ragged disarray. So this is the real McCoy, seems to be playing out pretty close to 2000. Always considered myself a fairly serious amateur historian. And what I've done in bubble territory is I, I don't try and build models to explain every day. I focus on the four great bubbles, which are characterized by nearly hysterical behavior really seriously weird over optimism, which is very rare, which are characterized by accelerated price moves on the upside and um, by a weird deviation on the upside between the blue chips going up and the risky stocks going down. And that is rare as hen's teeth. It happened brilliantly in 29. It happened during the year 2000, again in spades with the S&P X growth continuing to go up through September of 2000. And the growth stocks basically going down 50% and the uh, internet stocks dropping maybe uh, 60, 70% by then. So that was spectacular. And uh, we saw a very handsome deviation between the S&P rising last year and the Russell 2, uh, for example, dropping quite handsomely. So there was a 20, 25 point spread on the upside. And that for me is a pretty good indicator. And I'll tell you what it describes. It describes Mr. Prince's, I've got to keep dancing because the music's still playing. And we understand that completely, the enormous commercial imperative of the industry to play up to and over the edge, but they're not complete idiots. And so they say, well, I've got to keep dancing, but I don't have to keep dancing with Pumatech, the most advanced stock in 99. I'm going to transfer to Coca-Cola and I'll keep dancing off the edge, but I'll go off with Coca-Cola. And it works. The Coca-Colas maybe 
handsomely overpriced, but in 1929 and 2000, 2001 and so on, they always go down a lot less as the bubble breaks. And that's the phenomenon that causes this very rare indicator of impending doom, which we saw uh, last year. And so by early this year, it seemed clear to me that this was not only the real McCoy bubble, which had been clear for a year or so in terms of pricing and enthusiasm, but it had triggered this very rare indicator of impending doom, in other words, now. And so our piece of a year and a bit ago was called Waiting for the Last Dance. And our equivalent follow-up this January was Let the Wild Rumpus Begin, i.e. we're in it, dudes. <laughs> and uh, I do believe we are. And I believe the declines will be very substantial. We have a market today which feels superficially like 2000. And I think it's going to play out initially like 2000. And then, unfortunately, it's going to phase, as he suggests, into the 70s, where the uh, deflationary effects on the economy and the stock market will result in a world rather like the 70s, where all assets are simply much lower priced than they are today. I saw this article in Barron's, the title of it, If There's a Recession Coming, Not Even the Fed Could Stop It Now. You see, last year, at least last year, maybe before, I saw a recession coming, I saw inflation coming, and if I saw it, they had to see it. Why? Because they printed so much money on March 23rd, 2020, uh, Chairman Powell said, we are whipped in order to stop the collapse of the economy and the uh, stock market uh, due to COVID. Uh, he said, if we have to, we're willing to print unlimited amounts of money. And of course, he'd already dropped interest rates to zero. And the next trick he had in the bag of tricks was um, to print unlimited amounts of money. And as soon as he said that, the market took off. They saw it as an insurance policy against downside market risk. And uh, they never looked back. Of course, that was uh, creating a bigger problem called inflation because with all the excess money, trillions and trillions of dollars of excess money with nothing behind it, naturally, it's going to result in inflation. The Fed knows that uh, more than anyone. So in order to counter that, now what they've got to do is to, instead of increasing liquidity in the market, they've got to decrease liquidity in the market and uh, raise interest rates. Well, that create both of those, the combination of those creates a recession. Everyone agrees that you're going to put the brakes so heavily on the, mar the economy that you will have a, a recession and probably a significant recession. We have three major indicators, the SOM rule, the uh, Larry Summers 4% uh, rule, and the inverted yield curve. I've covered these before. The, all three of those are in negative territory. All three signaling, when they've occurred in the last 50 years, they have signaled a coming recession. So yeah, the Fed cannot stop it now because if they don't, if they don't raise interest rates, then you have out of control inflation. And if you have out of control inflation, uh, that's something they're not willing to tolerate. In Reuters, it, this article said, shadow of 1970s inflation is starting to worry bondholders. The older people get, the more bonds they have in their portfolio. Target date funds become heavier and heavier allocated to bonds the older a person gets. And I understand that bondholders would be worried because as, you, as interest rates go up, the price of bonds naturally goes down. They, they move in opposite directions. And we have only, they have only raised interest rates 1%. 1%, we've raised it three quarters of a percent all the way up to 1%. Professor Ken Rogoff at Harvard said that they can't go to two and to 3%, they will have to go to four and 5% probably in order to counter the level of inflation 
that we are having and that we're going to have. Yes, bondholders should be very worried. In the Financial Times, this article said, why markets need to heed the lessons of the 70s. I've said for over a year now, maybe a couple of years, I've said that what we're facing is a period of time very much like the 70s, the 73, 74 crash and the 79 to 81, 82 crash. Uh, both of them were much more characteristic of uh, today's market uh, climate than other uh, recessions because high inflation, rising interest rates, high energy prices, etc. In Brazil, they have a bigger energy problem than we do. Try living in Brazil, where the average cost of a liter of gasoline is $7.28 reals, equal to about $6 a gallon here. Here's the kicker. Brazilians making minimum wage are now spending about a third of their monthly income to fill up their tank. A third of their monthly income. In the U.S., that would be about 6% of the monthly income of a minimum wage worker. Can you see the impact that this has in Brazil? The Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index, the ISM uh, Index, uh, Institute for Supply Management, is a good uh, indicator for uh, how things are moving in the uh, manufacturing sector. You can see that on the prices paid chart, this is a price that they pay for raw materials, it is going through the roof. So when we buy something, consumable materials, consumer goods, uh, prices are going up rapidly, radically, and why? Because it is being passed on from the manufacturer to the retailer to the consumer. This is a also a manufacturing uh, index uh, from the Institute for Supply Management. And it is kind of a forecasting tool, a kind of a forward indicator showing that the yield curve for the 10-year treasury bond being an indicator for what's coming in uh, manufacturing. So the dark line you can see is the line for the, the direction it's going at the end of the chart. Uh, currently, uh, and you can see that's the uh, ISM index currently, but ahead of that, you can see where the 10-year uh, treasury yield is going, the spread is going, and it is definitely headed down, and it is believed that because this is a leading indicator that the uh, manufacturing index is going to follow, making putting it into very deep negative territory. I want to jump over to home sales, real estate. Uh, new home sales, this is a chart showing home sales, not the price of homes, but home sales. And you can see what happened in 2008, the housing crisis. You can see what happened with real estate. It dropped uh, radically, and we all know the story behind that. After that, real estate began to gradually come back, gradually come back, not getting close to its pre-2007 or 2008 levels, but gradually climbing its way back. And then it went pretty high in 2019, early 2020. And then we had the uh, COVID uh, pandemic and that came down and now it has come down even further. So I drew a line, a dark line, through a trend line showing the trend of new home sales going up out of the housing crisis. And then I drew a black arrow below that showing, if you can see this, at the very far right of your chart, the housing sales, the number of sales has dropped very rapidly 
this year. So it is now, just doing a visual on it, it looks like it is about at the level of 2017 levels, about at that level, 2017. So it's five years ago. So the uh, home sales are on their way down and prices have not yet begun to fall, but prices will be next. Now, I know that real estate is regional or local, and so each market is different. There will be some markets that will be worse than this. There will be some better than this. This is a national average, but it tells the story of a weakening economy and, in this case, a weakening housing market. This is a chart that shows eight, or excuse me, 10 different years. The, most, the current year, 2022, is in dark blue. And this shows the uh, same thing, the home sales end, index, uh, pending home sales. In other words, they've sold and they're waiting for closing. And you can see the trend of where it's going currently relative to other years. This is um, a very, other than 2020, uh, this is a very uh, sharp decline in home sales with nothing necessarily precipitating it like in 2020. When we go to the um, uh, single family homes that are sold, uh, you can see the direction of that and that has dropped again just this past month, dropped more rapidly than uh, any of the previous seven years. Inventory. Inventory goes usually in the opposite direction of uh, home sales. And so you can see the increase in the home inventory, homes for sale. Uh, the, home, the inventory is building. So we know what's coming. Uh, the real estate bubble is, in my opinion, in trouble. When there is a crash in the market, th these are charts of the S&P 500 superimposed on top of each other. When there is a decline in the stock market, a sharp decline that goes into bear market territory, that either occurs in a year when there is a recession or in a year when there is not a recession that followed, like for example, 2022. When there is a recession, the recovery from that collapse looks like the blue line. When there is not a recession that follows, it looks like the black line. If we are in a period, and we'll know at the end of this quarter, we're one month away. If we are in, in uh, have a negative um, growth, in other words, a uh, contraction in the economy, then we will officially be in a recession. And you can see from this chart what typically happens to the market in a recession. Buying stocks, buying the S&P, buying an index, doing anything at the bottom of a market, uh, one has to be very careful. What got a person into this mess is not what's going to lead them out of this mess. I referred to, Jeremy Grantham referred to 1973-74, uh, and then he referred to 1929. So I want to show you both of these and uh, show you what occurred in the stock market and give you some comments on it. 1973-74 was the period when oil prices were uh, rising very rapidly and inflation was rising. Inflation went from in 73 about 6% to uh, in 1974, the next year inflation was at 11% plus, 11%. So prices were rising very rapidly. We are, even after the manipulation on the CPI, we, Consumer Price Index, we are uh, still at 8.3%. So uh, that is still a long ways away from where we were in 1973-74, and a very long ways away from where we were in 1979 to 1982. So the stock market dropped 45% in 73-74, from its top to the bottom. 
What I wanted to point out is this. It's a very important thing to think as an investor, and I would think we have a number of investors that watch this. The way a market goes down typically is similar to this. If we were to look at 2008, it would be similar in this way. It doesn't go straight down. My red arrow goes straight down, showing you the direction, but the market follows the blue line, which it goes down and then it tries to go up. It goes down and it tries to go up because it's been used to going up and it's, it's trying to go back up. It's letting off some steam, if you will. And then it, 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 it's, it doesn't have the steam, so it just collapses. And so it drops and it drops and it drops after many attempts to go up. And finally, at the very end, and this is just a two-year chart here, so you can see these micro movements. At the very end, after, what, about 10 or 20 times of trying to go back up, eventually it becomes exhausted. And people throw in the towel. They've had it with the stock market. And then the market's ready to go back up. And then the big money comes in and drives the market up. But not until that exhaustion takes place. What will happen in the current market or the market that precedes the next recession, let's assume it's the current market, is that the market will go down quite a bit, as we saw this year, and then it will try to go back up for a while. That while could be a few days, a few weeks, even a month or two. And then because of the economic pressure on it, it pushes it back down again. So when we're in recession territory, bear market territory, which I believe we're in right now, be prepared for the market to go up during this period of time and then collapse. Go up and collapse. I call it a head fake. So the, the people become optimistic and because particularly it may go for a month or two and they think, okay, well, we're, we're, we're back to uh, the market, another bull market. No, we're not. Uh, they just drew in the unsophisticated, the weak buyers, the retail investor, they just drew those people in and then they slammed the hammer on them and drove the market back down. That's, that's the way the game is played uh, with big money. Now I want to show you uh, 1929. It's not a chart that we see very often, so I found this and I thought it was a really good chart. It did mark some uh, political uh, activity in these yellow boxes, but the but it did a good job of portraying the length of time that I wanted to show. So this covers the entire duration of the Great Depression, which went for quite a ways. And so all of this period of time up until World War II, all of this period of time, it was the Great Depression. And that is marked by the gray shadow, the vertical gray shadow on the left. There was a second Great Depression that we don't hear a lot about that occurred in 1937-38, and that was called the Second Great Depression. I'll get to that in a minute. So I wanted to show you the decline of the market during 1929 or for this entire duration. But the black arrow on the left shows the decline of the market from 1929 to 1932, marking a period of about three years. And the reason I'm showing this is because Jeremy Grantham says the conditions that we're in right now are what he calls a super bubble. This would be the fourth super bubble, according to him, in the last hundred years. The first one being uh, the um, stock market crash of 1929, which resulted in the Great Depression. Um, and then there were others. What was interesting about this, again, if you look below that black arrow, you see the same thing we saw in the previous chart. Five different times during the stock market crash of 29, going all the way down to 1932, five times the market tried to go back up. And for a period of time, maybe a month or two, people became optimistic. The retail investor came in and then the big money, Wall Street money slammed them back down and people lost money again. The sixth time at the very bottom, people were done. They threw in the towel, they lost everything they had in most cases, 
and they probably swore to themselves, I'll never invest another penny in the stock market because people were just wiped out. In addition, real estate prices had collapsed, jobs were nowhere, 25% unemployment, et cetera. There were many things that triggered it into the Great Depression, but the stock market itself was the delivering tool to deliver the blow to people that caused them to lose whatever they had invested. At the bottom of the black arrow is a little red arrow, a little tiny one. Because this is a numerical chart, an arithmetic chart, and not a logarithmic chart, it does not show the magnitude of that increase. And, but I'll, so the, let me say, first of all, the decline in the market went from its high in 1929 down to 1932, that decline was 88%, 88%. So I won't say people had 12 cents on the dollar left, that's just the market. People generally at that time were invested in this stock and that stock. Virtually all of those companies went out of business, went bankrupt. People by and large lost everything they had. Most people did. And, but the, when we look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it declined 88%. What was left was 12 cents on the dollar. At that point, when people were really wiped out, that was the ideal time to invest. However, people's emotions were wrung out. They were exhausted, they had no money left, they were swearing, I'll never invest in the market again. I understand that thinking and I understand those emotions, but that is the time to be invested. So it reminds me of the story I've told before of Joseph Kennedy, who got his tip from the shoeshine boy and determined, okay, when the shoeshine boy is giving you uh, investment advice, that's the time to get out of the market. And that occurred in 1929, I believe it was the summer of 1929, and from there, he actually got out of the market and shorted the market. And he went from having a net worth of about 50 million in, uh, at that time to billions, several billion dollars by 1935. So he made it by shorting the market. And once the market hit the bottom in 1932, he made various investments. I don't know the detail of those, but uh, somehow he was very astute about doing it. So the key to making money in the market is not to follow traditional financial advisor, traditional financial advisor advice. It's horrible because it has people invested at the top and they go all the way down. They are not protected and they are told that they can get bonds and those will protect them, and that has failed. This year it's failed, it's gonna to continue to fail if interest rates continue to go up, and I think they will. So that model is going to become a very antiquated uh, model that will be uh, rejected in the future, I believe, because it will fail people and it will f fail the financial advising industry. And, but that shows a level of decline that has happened and that will happen again if Jeremy Grantham is right or something like it. No one is saying, well, one person is saying, but most are not saying it's gonna decline 88%. Most are saying something less than that, but a very sharp decline. But I wanted to point out these opportunities along the way to make money. Our tactical model is very sensitive and is designed to get out of the way during periods of decline and to take advantage of periods, even though they may be short, because when you're looking into the future, you don't know which one of those is actually going up, which one is actually going to increase. That bottom one went up 82%. It doesn't look like it, but that first little arrow, that's an increase. When the Dow was at 41, it went up to 75. That's an increase of 82%. So when no one knew that somehow on the sixth try it was going to succeed. So we don't know either. So we become tactical. We invest when we think the market is moving up. We get out of the way when our indicators are telling risk, telling us that risk is entering the market. That's my opinion, the only way to do it. 
There are some opportunities there short term. But then when that bottom hits and the market zooms up 82% in 1932, no one wanted to invest. And if you were following a traditional method of investing, traditional financial advice, you were done. You were done with that advisor and you were done with the market and you were done with advice, all of it, you were done. But that was the time to invest. That's where the money was made. That's why I believe tactical investing makes so much sense. And then in 1932, it turned around and went back down again, delivering one more head fake. And then the second red arrow occurred. This time it went up 100% from 50 to 100, doubling approximately, doubling the money uh, that one had at that time using the Dow as an indicator. The distance of those red arrows is different because it's a numerical chart. Then it went sideways for a couple of years, another head fake. And then it went up from 100 up to 200, another 100% gain, the third arrow. And then the second Great Depression happened, another head fake. It was not destined to go to the moon, as people were thinking, in 19, at the end of uh, 1936. It actually began its way back down again and dropped another 50%. So there was, and after that, then um, it went sideways a bit, and then we entered World War II. So there's a lot of maneuvering that goes on to make money and protect money. In my opinion, I'm saying this because I believe it, it has worked for us. We have not been tested like this. I don't look forward to it. But if we are tested, we're prepared for it. But this is the way I believe that people can protect money the best and they can make money the best. And once we're tested, we're really tested, um, we will demonstrate that in live accounts and we will see how that goes. But I'm, I'm ready for it if it does happen. Looking at these charts, looking at where we are today, reminds me of the Titanic. It actually reminds me of Captain uh, Edward Smith. I've read quite a bit about the Titanic, studied the story, um, read a lot of accounts, seen a lot of original photographs, etc. And the story of Edward Smith is metaphorical for today in the financial and investing industry. I think of it like this. Captain Smith, when they were in port in uh, Southampton, England, the ship was being built. They were getting it ready for launch. He made the decision, two decisions I know of. He made one decision, which was to leave off the majority of the lifeboats that the ship was designed to carry. Why? In my opinion, pride. He was so confident that the mighty Titanic could withstand anything. Why bother with cluttering up the decks with lifeboats? They also had training for the crew in the case of an emergency. He canceled the training meeting uh, where they were trained how to deal with uh, emergencies, like the one they encountered. And then to the coup de grace was that fateful night on April 14, 1912. The, that day, the day of April 14th, as they were crossing the North Atlantic, he was getting messages I think at least six ships signaled him and said, icebergs ahead, icebergs ahead. He was warned no less than six times that there were icebergs ahead. He ignored all of those warnings, went up to the first class dining room and was having, I'm sure, a very nice uh, steak dinner and fine wine when that fateful event happened about 11.30 that night. Was he drunk on wine or 
other liquor. I don't know, maybe. But I know one thing, he had abdicated his responsibility and turned it over to people who did not have his experience and we know the rest of the story. In my opinion, this is very similar to what's going on right now. The financial industry, the large banks, the brokerage firms, your local financial advisor, all of them have access to the same information I do. And they are, have the opportunity to do something. What did they do so far in 2022? Not much, maybe nothing at all. But I think these are the voices. When I think of the voices that he heard that day, these are the voices that I think we are hearing today. They're available. If I can get them, believe me, everybody else can get them. Jeremy Grantham, who I quoted, said, this is like 1929 and 2000. People will be wiped out. Jim Rogers said, the worst crash in my lifetime is coming. It will be the mother of all crashes. Warren Buffett said, get ready to lose half your money. And Ray Dalio said, this will be worse than 2008. When I think of the experience and the knowledge of these men who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, who have seen decades and decades that your local financial advisor has not seen. And one more time, people are lulled to sleep. They're not listening to these voices. And I respect the voice, the voices of Jeremy Grantham, Jim Rogers, Warren Buffett, and Ray Dalio, and others. But I just pick on these because they are probably the most respected names in the investing world, certainly in the U.S., and maybe throughout the world. They are all saying icebergs ahead. So I think about all this and I thought, I'm not gonna just leave you here and feeling anxious. I'm, my goal is to help you get prepared. Get prepared for what's coming. I put together some uh, items, I put together eight of them, things that I would say these are for me. I didn't read these anywhere, I just thought about them. All but two of them could have applied to every crisis, every crash that we've had going back for the last 100 years, and it would have protected investor assets. If you did all eight, there would be no downside. I added two more because I think this time we're dealing with a few new challenges that were not present in the past. But I think these are the things that you can do. I don't expect everyone has the money to do this, that you can do them to perfection. But if you move in this direction, do as much as you can with whatever you can, it won't hurt you and it will probably help you. Watch out for buy and hold portfolios. We have seen this year, they have stopped working. Pay off as much debt as possible. Accumulate some silver, even though there are those, including Dave Ramsey and the financial uh, industry that say, don't buy it. Uh, I say, accumulate some silver. Real estate, this is a time for sellers not buyers. The market has not yet collapsed, but we are starting to see the cracks starting to appear. Be a seller, not a buyer. There will come a time to be a buyer. It's not today, in my opinion. Secure your job and your income as much as you're able. These are the couple of items that I added. I think that will be unique this time that there is no downside to them. Have a food and fuel backup plan. Be prepared. I'm uh, this week, I've got a lot of fuel, but this week, in addition to that, I'm buying me a bicycle because I'm prepared for the fact that maybe we can't get fuel or it will be so exorbitant, you don't want to buy it. Grow your own food if you're able. 
if you're not able to grow your own food, there are uh, local organic farmers that you can buy from in every community, every city, and establish a relationship with one. Get into the uh, food share uh, program, buy the food share program, or go to the farmer's market on the weekend and uh, get your groceries there. Get used to that because that is what you may uh, have to rely on we're already seeing food shortages and we're being told, I'm reading article after article, talking about coming food shortages, significant shortages this fall because of crops not being planted and weather issues, etc. And finally, I put a question mark on this one, money in the bank. Do you really want your money in the bank? Think about having money outside of the banking system. I'm not telling you what to do here. I'm putting a question mark on it. Think about it. Bitcoin. Uh, you know that I'm not a fan of Bitcoin. There's all kinds of people out there hyping it, and usually they're the people trying to make money on it by selling uh, somebody uh, on cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. And I'm not a fan of it. And uh, so for a variety of reasons. But I found this um, interview uh, that is done by Pippa Stevens from CNBC, and she interviews uh, Scott Minard, who is, um, well, I'll say it this way, he has a track record of being right. And I have not seen a time when he's been wrong. So uh, he doesn't put necessarily a date on it, but uh, he says something to say about Bitcoin. I'll play this for you. Guggenheim CIO Scott Minard said Bitcoin's recent slide could mean some big losses are still to come. We're seeing crypto collapse the way it is. I think it's got more downside to more it. More downside. More downside. How much more? Well, you know, um, when I look at uh, Bitcoin, which the technicals have been better than anything else, when you we break, you know, below 30,000 consistently, 8,000 is the ultimate bottom. So I think we've got a lot more room to the downside under, especially with the Fed being restrictive. And let's face it, most of these currencies are they're not currencies, right? They're junk, right? I mean, the majority of crypto is garbage. So they're going to be survivors. His prediction of Bitcoin hitting $8,000 translates to a 70% drop from current prices. Meanwhile, European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde spoke to a Dutch talk show about crypto ahead of her visit to Davos. And she said that in her opinion, crypto is worth nothing. So if Scott Meitert is right, and Bitcoin drops to 8,000, as he predicts, uh, it was at 65,000, and let's say it's at 30, 32,000 today. Uh, that's a drop of 50%. But the people, when it was at 60 to 65,000, believe me, the hyping crowd was out there saying it's going to 100,000, it's going to 200 to 250. Scott Minard, who I trust over the people that are hyping Bitcoin, says it's going to 8,000. And maybe if it hits 8,000, maybe that's the time you really should buy. I don't know. But I certainly would not buy it today, and I would not rely on it as a viable means of currency because it has nothing behind it. So you leave the dollar that has very little behind it to go over to something else that has nothing behind it. That does not make sense. Okay. I want to move into the uh, stock market, and this uh, is... Uh, uh, a dashboard showing uh, various indexes and the uh, position of them. Uh, this is through Friday on a year-to-date basis. And so I'll just go through them and comment. Uh, the Dow down 8%, S&P down 12%. Bonds represented by the exchange traded fund, TLT, the 20-year long-term government bond, down 19%. This was the insurance policy that was supposed to protect you using traditional financial advisors methods. They don't all buy TLT. They can buy other bonds, but all the bonds collapsed, defying their model. NASDAQ 100 down 22%. The technology sector of the uh, NASDAQ 100 down 25%. And the ARC K funds, the innovation funds, uh, by the ARC family of funds, down 52%. And of course, I love to pick on Netflix, 
down 67%. The six stock market averages, one is uh, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ 100, and the Russell 2000 small cap index fund, uh, all are below three of their four moving averages. They are all above their 20-day moving averages, thanks to a few-day rally at the end of last week, and but they are still definitely in bear market territory and are below their 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages, as you can see from the three dots on the far right of the chart. The EFA, which is the developed foreign markets, same thing. And the emerging foreign markets, same thing. All above their 20-day and all below their 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages, telling me they're all clearly in bear market territory. That could change. Maybe we'll go up from here, as you've seen in the previous charts. Maybe we'll go up for a month, even a couple of months, or maybe it's a few days. We don't know the future. But we do know that there was a rise at the end of last week, signaling a move in an upward direction on a very short-term basis. When I break the S&P down, it, there are 11 sectors in the S&P. One of those sectors, the energy sector, is the only one that is above its 20, 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages, energy. All of the others are, excuse me, and the basic materials. And all of the others are, most of them are above their 20-day moving averages and um, below their 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages. So you can see there are 19 dots uh, that uh, signal that the uh, positive above their moving averages compared to four last week. So definitely an improvement in the uh, charts. Now I want to move over to the um, uh, line charts. The S&P 500 uh, is represented by the line that moves up and down, and it's uh, what cuts through it is the 20 period moving average. Now this is a weekly chart. So for the week, one move equals one week. So you can see at the far right of the chart that the direction is down when looked at on a weekly chart. And I'm sure when we look at it on a daily chart, it would be the same thing. But you can see that sharp move up at the end. Will that continue on up and will it even get above its 20 period moving average? We'll find out. But it was positive indication that the market is moving up, uh, at least at this point, represented by the S&P 500 SPY. Then I compare the growth index numerator to the value index denominator, SPY G divided by SPY V, showing growth stocks compared to value stocks, all within the S&P 500. And you can see for about this is a 12-month chart. So for about five months, the um, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, value excuse me growth was in favor. The following seven months, value was in favor, meaning the chart went down. The the index went or the comparison went down, favoring value over growth to that extent quite a bit. They both went down. But as you've seen from previous data using like the Dow versus the NASDAQ 100, the um, uh, value definitely this year has outperformed even negative territory. It did not go down as much, outperform growth. Small cap represented by the index uh, ETF IWM. IWM being the numerator and SPY being the denominator. So this shows how is the small cap index doing relative to the S&P 500, which includes uh, large cap stocks. Small cap versus large cap. General direction over the last 12 months is small cap has way, way underperformed large cap. 
When we look at the uh, long-term government bond, TLT, uh, and this is an absolute chart, not a relative chart. So this is the absolute movement of TLT over the past 24 months, and it's a weekly chart. So you can see both the red line and the more recent black line to the right shows that for these periods of time, the bonds have been in decline. And this is what I have been saying. Bonds are in decline. About uh, 15 months ago or so, we got completely out of bonds because I saw this coming and I didn't want anything to do with it because I thought this is going to be the future of bonds. And sure enough, here we are. So if you're in bonds, and most investors are, you're going to have to decide, <laughs> is this what you want? Gold, represented by the ETF GLD, 24-month chart, a lot of up and down, mostly up and down. I looked for a trend line. There's a longer-term trend line that might be slightly down. There's one, I picked one that's slightly up, but in general, it's mostly up and down. Silver, same thing, more up and down. And uh, you can see there are two trends that have developed. One is a downtrend represented by the red line and an upward trend represented by the longer term represented by the black line. And then when I compare the two in a relative basis, putting silver as the numerator, gold as the denominator, you can see that silver outperformed, again, 24 months, that silver outperformed gold represented by the red line for a period of about, I'll say nine or 10 months, it looks like. And then for the last 14, 15 months, uh, gold has outperformed silver uh, and re represented by the line going down for that period of time. They change places over time, but in general, uh, they either generally go up or they generally go down. They tend to move uh, together. The volatility index, I've shown you this. This is as of Friday. The, uh, because the market has gone up this past week, the, that means the volatility index is going to tend to drop. So the I represented by that by the black arrow. So you can see over the past few weeks that volatility in the market has started to come down. It is now at about 26 and something. And I drew the line at 24 because that is an arbitrary uh, number where people pay attention to is there volatility in the market, meaning above 24 or less volatility, meaning below 24. But again, not unlike uh, precious metals, this has gone up and down quite a bit during the past year. The uh, Asbury Research does uh, a chart or uh, metrics, six metrics they measure of is what is going on with the market. Those were all negative last week. And this past week, uh, toward the end of the week, they turned, uh, uh, four of them turned positive. So four out of six are now positive, indicating what I've said before, the, in a short-term basis, at least so far, the market is moving in an upward direction, even though the general trend is still down. The uh, spot prices for gold and silver, gold at 1856, and silver at 2215, both having uh, positive gains, and this is as of May 29th. Inflation. Inflation is upon us and is roaring ahead. The biggest issue out there, yes, it may be um, interest rates, it may be potential breakdown in housing prices, but the biggest issue that all of us have to do, deal with is inflation and relative to wages, uh, inflation is overpowering income and wages. And I think this uh, cartoon depicts it correctly. I will put links to the um, articles and quotes that I've given below in the comment section. If you have questions, or comments, feel free to leave them. Any question, uh, I will answer. Thank you for watching.